so good morning everyone i am amita roy i lead the solution architects team here at red hat we have several of our colleagues here from red hat that are part of the developer business unit i think they have a great job because you know their primary objective is how to make the lives easier for developers and how to really contribute to developer productivity and i'm sure you'll be meeting them through the day through the various sessions and on the sidelines of the event last week i had a chance to attend the gartner it symposium in cochin and um one of the sessions was they were talking about what are the key trends that they're seeing in software engineering and what was interesting is that one key trend among those was developer experience you know so we are very happy that you know whatever we are doing is in line with whatever uh, you know gartner's research is uh, demonstrating and i think it's uh, uh, it's in in some ways if you really look at it it's not a surprise right today if businesses have to transform you know they have to really look at what services are they providing to their clients and if they have to look at what services they're providing to their clients they depend on applications if they depend on applications they depend upon people who develop those applications maintain those applications right so this is a very key area of focus then for red hat and and that's the reason why everything that we're going to talk about in the next 30 minutes is about what red hat is doing to really help drive you know developer productivity and if you really look at a comparison between past and the present right when i started off my career we had to write all the code from scratch you know so while you know when i started off to c++ and very well very soon java had entered the scene but we wrote everything you know so it was all about you know compilers debuggers etc and that's what programming languages were about by the time my son went to college you know there were templates that were available and you could you know fill in the blanks kind of a thing where you write the business logic and you know put in some of the rest of the coding right today we are talking about a lot of code assistance that is available via tools but at the same time you know while one may think the lives of developers have become easier i would you agree i i think it's become a little more complex because you know today when we are talking about companies driving digital transformation are they writing applications from scratch no right there are legacy applications there are applications you are building which are in a cloud native manner then you know you have a whole bunch of deployment environments right you may be deploying on bare metal private clouds public clouds you know today we are talking about edge as well right so and then we are talking about this whole hybrid mix of applications and to add to that we are now talking about ai ml workloads as well right so it's not exactly become easier so how then you know can we continue to drive developer productivity while ensuring that you know security and everything else is not you know comprom uh, compromised with so in that context when organizations focus on developer productivity there is research that says that the revenue uh, you know can go up to 4x 400% increase you know that's the kind of uh, focus that you know developers then you know and the organization they work with are trying to bring in and when you talk of productivity it's not just about speed at which you develop right there are so many other factors that need to come into it and in that context when we look at an ideal developer experience there is some research that has come from uh, you know the university of victoria and microsoft research where they have brilliantly captured about 25 factors that impact developer productivity and that has come into a framework of three which is what i'm going to talk about one is cognitive load the other is flow state and the third is feedback loop and everything that we're going to talk about is in relation to this right so when we talk about cognitive load just the other day you know as is typical in in a uh, day in my life you know i am in a hotel room i enter the room and you find that the tv is already on you know trying to give me some promo about you know whichever brand of hotel i'm staying in and i'm looking for the remote to turn it off 
not turning off, then I think it's a battery problem is issue and all that. I call housekeeping and then I feel very sheepish when they tell me that this remote is not for the switching off of the TV. This remote is for something else and this TV is, this one is for, for you to browse the channels. Okay. Now, all of us have been, uh, have seen all kinds of remote controls in our lives, right? Don't you think this is a lot of cognitive load? How many of these buttons do we actually use? You know, we probably need to switch channels, increase volume, uh, decrease volume and, you know, probably turn off the TV, right? So, if you really look at this, isn't this a lot more simple and intuitive, right? So, it's, it's in every walk of our lives. A few years ago, I had to go to a bank and fill in a chalan if I had to go and transfer money to somebody and then they will take that counterfoil, stamp it, give it to me and that's how money transfer is to happen. Then we said net banking happened and now we are talking about using QR codes and you know just doing it on the fly, right? A lot of cognitive load that has been reduced, you know. Imagine if we can bring the same wow factor to developers as well. Reduce the cognitive load and what do we mean by that? We're saying that when developers are, you know, getting started up, let's say you joined a company, okay, and you have to get started, how long does it take before you can become productive? You have to set up, you know, whatever are the processes, the tools and everything else before you can really start writing any productive code, right? So, how can we reduce all that cognitive load for developers? What's the first, you know, area that we wanted to focus on? And in order to do that, and this has to follow you all through, right? It's not just the onboarding part. You know, through the developer experience, how can we abstract you away from the complexity, you know, till such a time that we talk about all the observability and, you know, monitoring, etc., that becomes the feedback loop. So, in that context, when we have to look at, you know, how we can help the onboarding experience, that is where we're talking about the Red Hat Developer Hub. The Red Hat Developer Hub is basically an internal developer platform. So what it does is it's very flexible, it's very extensible, and it allows everybody in the team, you know, to have a single pane of glass, and this is actually helping improve a lot of the engineering productivity, because everything that you need in order to be able to set up, you're able to do that with the best practices, with the guardrails, set up for security. There are also golden paths that will guide you in terms of, you know, what to do next. So it integrates with all the best of industry standards. And as Ashutosh had mentioned a little earlier, if you've all heard about the CNCF project called Backstage, then Developer Hub is basically Red Hat's optimized, supported, and opinionated version of Backstage, okay? So what we will do is, in order for you to get a feel of what this is about, I'll request Ramki to give us a quick de uh, demo of Developer Hub. And how many here in the audience think uh, all the code uh, you write for your organizations and all the code which you use are assets to your organizations? And how many of you think it's a liability for your organization? Right? Writing code is easy, okay? You don't need humans anymore to write code also. You've seen that in the last few months. Okay. But another thing is maintaining code over a period of time, okay, is become one of the most critical factor. And very few people would be lucky in order to work on projects where they get control on what programming languages they want to use, what uh, uh, frameworks they want to use, where they want to deploy these projects. Very, very few people, maybe startups or some, or some big organization trying to explore a new, new uh, paradigm or a new cloud or a new offering or a service from the cloud, they get to do. But day in and day out, in most of our careers in life, we are going to use, um, so you're going to be working with somebody else's code. Okay, you're going to be working with somebody else's patterns. And sometimes you'll just be working with binaries. The original development teams of those code won't uh, exist. Okay, there might be code which you're working, which was written in 1990s. Or, yeah, I mean, if you're, in, if you're trying to modernize mainframe systems, you, that code could have come from 1970s and 80s also. But the thing is, these code last for a long time and they, and they keep the businesses, businesses up and running. So, one of the critical factors is developer onboarding, okay? So most of the, India is very big in the service industries. You have, you have lots of global system integrators here. So one of the main, one of the main uh, uh, profit areas is working with legacy code and trying to keep the existing business the way it is running and trying to bring a lot of innovation into the newer businesses, okay? Technology, I mean, 
uh, on its own can't uh, you know uh, can't deliver results you need the processes around technologies too it's not just the tools right like for example if somebody gives me a formula 1 car to come from you know uh, dumlur to here okay it wouldn't make some any sense for me right i just need to go from point to point b okay and probably it won't even start on these road so so it is like that so you need the right tools you need the right processes and also you need a lot of uh, the, a lot of things around the devsecops is about the culture which is uh, uh, which is around these tools and projects so most of the uh, most of the companies try to differentiate their engineering efficiencies right uh, what do you mean by engineering efficiencies the developers would like to make their code run a bit more faster it's not like uh, you have seen a new paradigm new framework and your code is going to increase by 30% or 40% these small 2% 3% changes will have a lot of impact in your uh, in business deliverables so this is what they're trying to do and somebody who is in the ops side is trying to secure his deployments uh, uh, secure his deployments in the sense uh, he is going to make his pipelines more secure He's, he's, he's trying to see if his end users, okay, the endpoints uh, don't have weak passwords or like those things. So, how many of you heard of the solar winds issue which are happening, right? And the CDN password was admin one two three, okay. So, so things like this, okay. It, it is why, why do these errors happen? It's because of the cognitive overload which the developers and the operations within the team uh, have, and this one can have an impact on what is going on in the uh, what is going on in the delivery cycle. So, yes, there are companies with great engineering cultures, but still oversights can happen uh, like these, right? So, one of the tools is uh, Backstage. I'll just. Uh, uh, show uh, what uh, backstage looks like i have already made a deployment in order to save time so here we have a simple uh, project right uh, so think of wind turbine inc as a gaming company which we have started and we want to uh, uh, games uh, out here and uh, this uh, and people participating in this game get green credits when they when they run this game so this is how uh, most of your organizations have a uh, source code uh, repository within your organization and you will be working with various uh, teammates like uh, here within the uh, within my organization i have various uh, uh, teammates and they're they're working on their own projects sometimes we work with uh, we work with a certain member in a certain team sometimes we have our own independent teams and all so but the thing is uh, uh, think of yourself that you have just onboarded yourself onto this project and or to this uh, company, and you want to get started. You want to know what is going on, where are the Git, where are the Git repositories, where are the testing systems, uh, what is the ideal developer setup for this particular project. So, how many of you have uh, onboarded yourself into an organization and been productive the first day, the first week, okay, the first month? Three months, right? So the thing is, like, uh, when I go and talk about developer productivity with certain organizations, and then then the developer in that company says, "I got my laptop after two and a half months," right? So it happens, right? Uh, it happens. Many companies have tight budgets, and they want to be sure that uh, you know he's not he's not going to take the I mean the person is not going to take the client's code and run away and sell it on the black uh, I mean dark markets or like those things. And it it has happened. There are quite a few uh, there are quite a few places where. Uh, Companies sue each other uh, and get sued by each other because there has been leakage in the code, and this code leakage could have happened with a third-party company, which is out there. So it is always critical. Uh, how many of your laptops are encrypted? Your personal? How many of your personal laptops are encrypted? Right. So th these are few of the things. Right. You don't do it because it's a cognitive load. Right. But you need to do it. Right. Okay. One simple question: How many of you have switched off your biometrics in Aadhaar? See, only 20% of the crowd. People know uh, they lose money with it, okay? But still, they don't do it, right? Because this is a cognitive overload. One, you probably you don't know where to read about it. Second, you don't know how to do it, right? So, uh, and the and to add all of these things, the amount of technology, the rate of change of technology is faster than what training programs can keep up with, okay? This given point of time, 2023. Uh, if I go and ask somebody who is doing system programming, 
uh, what programming languages you are using, they probably would say Go or Rust. Okay. Uh, and if you if you ask someone who is in um, uh, who 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 is uh, in legacy code, they might say I'm working with you know Java 17, Java 21. Now I want to try few few of the uh, Java polyglot uh, programming languages built on the JVM uh, along with my stack. So these are few of the things. So any company can have diverse polyglot uh, structures. So so one of the easiest ways is like for example uh, how. Um, uh, developer Hub uh, enables this. Is, it makes the onboarding process easy. It makes the coding standards within your teams easy. Okay, so this one would improve the efficiency of onboarding, and the developers within your organization would have the would, would have only the piece of code or only the piece of uh, third-party code which they are need which they need to have. They won't have all random pieces of software. It is true, open source has uh, given a lot of velocity for developers in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, not reinventing the wheel. You're just taking some open source project, putting it into your code base, and you're running. It is also true that 90% of the code bases don't update their dependencies over a period of two years, which includes a lot of vulnerabilities. And uh, most of you might have also listened to the NPM uh, fiasco which had happened. One of the developers decided to remove his package. It kind of broke Instagram, uh, Facebook, and half of like almost there was a world war at that given point of time. So yeah, so this is how a typical organizational repository looks like, and um, and here we have a hosted instance of uh, uh, we have a hosted instance of uh, uh, OpenShift, which is our enterprise Kubernetes distribution. So the way uh, it has been integrated into the workflow uh, is uh, like say. Um, we just need to go over here and uh, uh, enable backstage. The, the product name is Red Hat Developer Hub. It is still in tech preview. Uh, it is going to release uh, very soon. If you, if you want to try it out, please uh, send us an email. At, uh, I'll give the email address. So this is how a typical, um, uh, th th this is our opinionated way of how a backstage should look like for enterprise customers. Uh, because the kind of customers which Red Hat works with are very large enterprises. These are uh, all the banks all the airline companies, uh, stock exchanges, defense organizations of various countries, space organizations of various uh, uh, countries. So this is how it looks like. So one, one, uh, um, one thing over here, it, it kind of pools in all the resources within your organization, uh, all the projects which are within the organization, and you can get a map of what, what and all is going on within your organization once again to your uh, code basis. So one of the first things is like the tech radar. Most of you might have seen this. So here um, you can take a look at uh, what and all uh, footprint is there within our organization. What are they assessing? What are the, what are the projects within our organization assessing? What are, what are there in trial period? What, what kind of software components have been adopted within my organization? So you can pull from the resources. Uh, you can pull from uh, your whole organization. What is the whole overall structure? Like, for example, in this organization, it seems to be a front-end uh, application. Obviously, it's a gaming company. Uh, so it's JavaScript, TypeScript heavy. And uh, most of the, maybe they're using Python for some, uh, some data analysis or writing small frameworks. Uh, and if you also take a look at it, the projects which are on hold, are legacy projects, say Python 2.x has been end of life, Java 8 has been uh, end of life, COBOL, uh, I don't know why COBOL is still there, but Co in 2021, Co COBOL programmers are one of the highest paid programmers, okay, who would have thought that, right? Because there are legacy systems keeping the businesses running and still they have not uh, taken. And also in terms of the frameworks which are being adopted within your organization, you get that. And uh, another thing, another critical thing is uh, you get a catalog of who is running what projects within uh, within the organization? Okay, who is running, uh, uh, let's say, a photo app generator? Who is uh, who is running uh, any other thing? You can also take a look at the components and who are the owners of these components, and see what uh, uh, what components uh, each e each and every user is using within the organization. This is another uh, thing. Uh, and uh, what you need to do uh, is the other thing is the learn paths. Like when whenever somebody is onboarded onto the project they are invariably going to spend a lot of time uh, searching for uh, you know, how to use this framework or how to, uh, how to use a particular API in a certain way. Documentation of your code, you know, uh, 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 documentation as a service within your own organization where the senior architects or the lead engineers can uh, write it saying that 
on the software components which we have written, we have also created a learning path, okay? This is how you need to onboard yourself onto the project. How do these set of APIs within our organization work? So documentation is very critical, uh, uh, not, not just within your code basis, but how, uh, how a developer, like if he's an integration engineer, what he needs to be doing, what are the various processes we follow within the organization. Once everything is documented, it reduces the cognitive load from the developer. He wouldn't go searching uh, randomly on Stack Overflow or uh, go, uh, or try to generate code from uh, ChatGPT or any other code generation tools and put it back into the project. So these are a few of the things which would uh, which would work. Uh, generative AI is not bad, but you need to train it on the data models within your own organization. The other thing is, uh, once you do that, the senior engineers or the lead engineers within your organization can create these golden path templates. And what these golden part templates are certain uh, certain pieces of code or certain pieces of stack which are within your organization where anybody who is going to join within that particular organization or that particular business group can get themselves onboarded onto this project. Here, uh, there are quite a few uh, golden paths which are available, but all of these golden paths are custom made for the developer groups within the, uh, within the organization. How does a typical golden path look like in the back end? Uh, so these are the templates, uh, how, how this path looks like. Uh, like you just need to uh, define, uh, define what are the components, which version of uh, Kubernetes is here, and where you're going to deploy it. Uh, you can create templates. So these are scaffolding templates. So within your organization, you need to create a scaffolding um, uh, template like this. Uh, uh, to show what are the what are the stacks you are using, what are the frameworks, what are the build tools. Uh, within that, what are the base uh, repositories and the images what you're using. And also within your organization, you can use your GitHub, uh, GitHub Enterprise, and uh, or or any other uh, uh, code repository within your organization in order to deliver this. And after this, uh, you can share this template within uh, the, the template gets pulled uh, over here, and this is how you can uh, share share with your teammates. Like suppose somebody has joined this organization and he wants to onboard him onto this project. All he has to do is choose this project, okay? Because in the template, it's going to get the information where it is going to get deployed. Like for example, here it's going to be deployed on an OpenShift instance. This one could change. See, all of these components are open source. You can, you can use them within your own organization. Uh, uh, you can tie them together. Uh, but then you need to do that extra effort of keeping this underlying platform up and running uh, also. So then you have two problems. One, you have your business problem to solve. Next, you have uh, 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 a backstage instance to keep it updated. And after that, like say, if you want to say, uh, what are the namespace of that project within the infrastructure? And you can choose who is the owner uh, who, who will be doing this project. So, and then you need to provide the, in which registry you want to store this thing. So as soon as you, um, uh, hit uh, click and create. Uh, it would it would uh, create a whole template for you, and it will create a whole catalog catalog for you. So hopefully, uh, uh, a few of the things are already uh, available. I have already set up one uh, one uh, pipeline over here. This is uh, the overview of what happens in the uh, what happens in the project. Like as soon as I do that, uh, if, if you take a look at it, it starts a Git, Git repository and it starts populating. And any developer who gets onboarded onto your project can, can, can get access to that source code. Thanks, Ramki. And I hope uh, you know, you're able to appreciate the, the cognitive load part of it that Developer Hub is able to reduce, right? I'll tell you an interesting statistic, but before that, let's hear from you. You know, how many productive hours of actual coding that one is able to achieve in a day? In one work hour day, let's say eight hour day, you know, how much of productive time actual coding happens? Okay, well, the industry average is 55 minutes. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and the rest could be taken up with anything else. You know, the things Ramki was talking about, setting up, environments, meetings, and you know, whatever else, right? And many times, you know, you may get this feeling that if I was just in that flow, you know, when I'm in that zone, you know, when I want to do some productive coding, we all get into that zone sometimes, right? When we are at our productive best, right? You want no interruptions, you want no distractions, and that's when you give, you know, your best in terms of the coding, okay? So how do we get you in that flow state? It reminds me of, you know, and uh, I am very unapologetic about it, but, uh, you know, we, we 
if I have to use the term binge code, right? It reminded me of binge watching Netflix. Okay, now what has Netflix done from a user experience standpoint just for some people like me who binge watch uh, Netflix dramas on the weekend, okay? Once one episode is over, have you noticed it automatically moves to the next one, right? It doesn't wait for you to see the titles and all that and then you can skip recap, you can skip intro and you know, you can get into that flow. And there are times when Netflix has to ask me, are you still there kind of a thing because we're just moving episode after episode, right? That's binge watching. So what if you could achieve that when you're in the right flow and the right state and the right zone, if you're able to get the right flow, if you're in that flow state. Now that's what, you know, we're trying to talk about. And in that context, you know, you may all, all have heard this term of inner loop. So basically when we talk about inner loop, you know, whatever are the packages, libraries, whatever else you need to do to be able to, uh, you know, develop and get with some product, productive code, you know, done. That's all that aspect of the inner loop, you know, the part of the developer uh, life cycle. So, in that context, what we're trying to do is, you know, Podman desktop is the area that Red Hat has been focusing on in order to be able to give uh, an easy way for developers to be able to work in their local development environment, to be able to ease the way you're developing code in your environment and, you know, the what needs to go into the production environment. So if you're creating the uh, container applications, for example, and, you know, being able to, you know, get them into the pods, you know, into a Kubernetes, and, you know, to be able to deploy them, you know, into uh, OpenShift and so on and so forth in as seamless a manner as possible. That's the, you know, uh, effort that's going in in terms of making sure that you have the right plugins to your developer sandbox, to your local uh, environment and so on. So, in order to tell us more about this and, you know, how we can, you know, work uh, uh, well with a Podman desktop, I'll give it back to Ramki. By default, uh, Podman runs as rootless, unprivileged containers by design, right? So that, uh, so that way, uh, what happens with the uh, underlying uh, containers is uh, it doesn't get access to the underlying root, okay? And there is no, uh, and there is no room for uh, one container having malicious code affecting other other containers within the. Uh, 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 within the underlying uh, platform, right? So this is one of the uh, one of the ways Podman started getting popular. And by default, uh, Red Hat uh, in most of the OpenShift instances, we run Podman by default. Uh, and another way uh, Podman has been popular. Uh, 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 popular is one, the security aspect uh, of Podman is, uh, it has also been, uh, it, it's also a CRIO compliant, the cryo compliant container, so you can use your Podman, Podman containers on, uh, on any of your Kubernetes uh, instances. Um, and another thing is most of the uh, most of the new software which is being created by most of the organizations, most likely 50% of the organizations are uh, creating container images out of their code, and they're distributing their code as uh, container uh, uh, as containers. And this has become one of the skills which everybody needs to needs to know and needs to have uh, in order to deliver their software to uh, end end uh, environments. So. Uh, uh, Podman Desktop has been a project uh, which is kind of a drop-in replacement for Docker Desktop. Uh, Docker Desktop, uh, uh, Podman Desktop is completely free. It has got a very vibrant open source community around it and there are, uh, 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 last month we kind of hit 700k downloads. It's an upstream open source project uh, backed by Red Hat. Uh, there's a vibrant community uh, of contributors who are also non-Red Hat who are contributing to the code base of Podman Desktop. So. I'll just show you how Podman desktop looks like. So all the all the sessions, the developer hub, uh, Podman, all of them have deep dive sessions later. Uh, later today, I'm just giving a tech preview of uh, what Podman desktop is and how it looks like. So this is uh, this is how the Podman desktop looks like. Uh, it's not a complete thing. Uh, I'll just uh, change the resolution of it. So here, if you take a look at it, there are quite a few extensions of uh, Podman Desktop. Uh, you have the Docker extension for Podman Desktop, then you have uh, you have the Kind extension, Lima, and also uh, my friend Deshwant would be uh, showcasing the Red Hat Developer Sandbox, where uh, you can connect your uh, Podman Desktop to the various registries which you are working with. It's, it's pretty simple. You go to the settings, uh, you go to the registry, and here you can, uh, uh, you can set up various registries and you can configure them. And then uh, there are uh, various other things uh, uh, which are available as part of uh, the Podman desktop. 
How many of you know what a Kubernetes pod is? Right? So here, if you want to run, uh, uh, if you want to run your containers as a pod within your local system without using Kubernetes also, it can be done. All you have to do is select which pods you want to, uh, uh, you want to run together and uh, uh, start them together. So it is, uh, it is like that. Then all of these things can form a, uh, can form a pod of various uh, containers working together. And this is kind of, uh, this is kind of a way in which uh, most of the software is going to be delivered. In, you, you can't solve all the use cases with Kubernetes. Some kind of workloads require certain pieces of software to be written as containers, but not run in Kubernetes also. And also in certain cases, uh, you, you, you might be running it on a large machine within your own node. You could use that. Of course, there are Kubernetes projects like a single node, uh, uh, single node cluster and uh, various things which are coming. But uh, this is one of the ways in which you can deliver software uh, using containers without using Kubernetes. Uh, also. Uh, another thing is you can also uh, um, pull in your images from various uh, repositories, uh, various image repositories from like key.io or uh, Docker Hub and various places and also pull. And you can also, uh, you can also uh, build, your build your container images locally and then you can, uh, uh, you can send them to the registries. So we, in the next talk, we'll be showing the Red Hat developer, uh, 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 the developer sandbox in which you can, even if you don't know what uh, uh, Kubernetes is or container, you are just a developer. You can onboard your applications onto a, a Kubernetes uh, uh, a compliance system like uh, OpenShift, and it is going to build the container images for you. It is going to scaffold uh, your source code. It is going to bring. Uh, it is going to create templates for you to make your applications containerized, and then you can deploy it onto any of the uh, certified Kubernetes distribution, not just OpenShift. So these are few of the uh, few of the tools uh, which are available, and another tool which uh, Praveen, my colleague, will be uh, covering is uh, something called OpenShift Local. Within the within the sandbox environment, if you want an enterprise way of delivering your software, uh, you can have an OpenShift instance locally onto your workstation. You can experiment it out there, and then you can connect it to your production environments and just uh, ship your code and images to uh, to those environments. Um, like for example, for creating a container, it is as simple as this. You give access to the Docker file uh, wherever it is, um, and then uh, and then you can create an image name. You can give the image name to be locally, or you can use uh, uh, like uh, your uh, uh, registry. Uh, another thing is, uh, if you uh, if you want your instance to be uh, running on a developer sandbox, you can just uh, register for a free developer sandbox, which they'll be covering in the next session, and then you can uh, export the project what you've built there onto the developer sandbox. These are few of the uh, few of the instances in which uh, you can create your uh, container images, and then you can deliver the uh, you can deliver the project to production. Uh, and there are quite a few de desktop extensions which are available. If you have a Docker extension which you had worked uh, uh, previously with, uh, you can you can uh, uh, you can bring in that uh, re uh, registry. Sorry, you can bring in that uh, extension to Portman Desktop also. And uh, if you don't have an extension or if you have something unique, you can always raise a uh, GitHub issue on the project, and uh, uh, the, the the project maintainers and the de developers and the community could uh, contribute to it. Uh, could contribute to the code. So this is how uh, Docker uh, desktop is. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Portman desktop is, I beg your pardon. So yeah. Uh. So the third thing that we want to talk about is the feedback loop, okay, which is extremely important. And this is something that has been demonstrated over and over again, that organizations that you know, have shorter iterative cycles, okay? If you are able to deliver code in shorter iterative cycles and have that feedback looping in for the remaining development, they are far, far more successful than the ones that have that one large big bang kind of an approach. And I think most organizations have moved away from that, you know, that whole waterfall and everything that we used to talk about years ago. I think that's a thing of the past. Today, everyone is talking agile, everybody is talking iterative, but what's important is that feedback loop, right? And going back to the Netflix example, I think being able to give the right recommendations based on the, uh, the patterns uh, that, uh, you know, a viewer is, uh, you know, typically watching what genre of, uh, you know, uh, uh, viewership that they're having and, you know, taking the feedback and putting that uh, back into the loop is one of the OTT channels that I've seen uh, them doing very well. And it's true with our, uh, uh, similarly with our uh, 
so here we talk about the outer loop. The outer loop is typically where you know your build happens, you're checking for compliance, the security checks, etc., and moving into production, right? So this is where you, you might be deploying into a Red Hat OpenShift environment. I wonder why those black patches are coming uh, in between. So, so here, uh, you know, we want to talk about the Red Hat trusted software supply chain. So when we talk about the software supply chain, you know that uh, security cannot be bolted on. Security can never be an afterthought. Security has to happen much earlier. And how many of you use a lot of open source components in your code? You know, the fact is that there are, you know, millions of open source components that are there in the communities. They are being used quite a lot, okay? And they go through several version changes. If for some reason the component you chose to use in your code goes into production and since then it has undergone some more changes but the version that you have, you know, has some vulnerability, it can become very risky for your production uh, code, right? Now, what Red Hat Trusted Software uh, Supply Chain hopes to do and achieves uh, is to be able to give you trusted content. You know, Red Hat, you know, software components are anyway are going to be secure, verified, etc. But all the components, you know, if we are able to tell you from your IDE itself, if there are any vulnerabilities, if there are any security, uh, uh, you know, breaches, and if we are able to give you the whole provenance in terms of, you know, where this code came from. You know, so that you can be sure that this is trusted code. That's going to be very, very important. Otherwise, today, if you really look at any AI-generated code or anything, you know, the biggest problem is the ethical and the legal concerns, right? Where did, that, where did that content come from? Is it from a trusted source? Otherwise, you will end up, you know, kind of incorporating it into something and that could, you know, lead to problems in the later uh, stages, right? So right from being able to give you that whole provenance, that whole audit trail, to being able to generate software bills of material. That's what, you know, trusted content and trusted software supply chain hopes to achieve. So Ramki will give us a quick uh, view of yeah. what that is about. So we've been working on uh, quite a bit of uh, tools, uh, like one of the tools which would show is, sorry. We, we do have uh, quite a bit of tools and uh, uh, extensions which are built in at uh, various places. One is at the coding phase itself. Uh, we have tools to check for vulnerabilities which are there in your existing code. Uh, this is called the dependency analytics. Um, my colleague Mohit will cover about that in, uh, in detail uh, within his session. So if you go to uh, the VS Code extensions, and this is also available for IntelliJ and other popular editors. So if you take a look at, uh, uh, if you just put Red Hat over here, there are quite a few extensions uh, which are available, and one such extension is the dependency, uh, uh, the Red Hat dependency analytics. Uh, so what this one does is it takes a look at your source code, see if there's any known vulnerabilities which are uh, uh, which are there within your code bases, and it will also create a, it will also generate a report and uh, share with you. Okay, uh, this is uh, you need to update it to this version, or you need to most probably remove this particular piece of code and put it uh, and uh, replace it with another code if there is any license violation. So, since open source is popular, 90% of the code bases use open source within their uh, components. There is also a high high risk, especially in the, for the enterprise developers. There's always a high risk of mixing and matching your software licenses. Like for example, you can't have a piece of code as a dependency within your project which uses Apache, and then try to put that code within something which is under GPL. So it'll be a uh, it'll be a license violation also. And especially if you are taking it to markets like North America or Europe or something which has various uh, gates and checks in place. So what happens with those things is you need to catch all of these problems much earlier. You might have heard about this term called shift lift. Try to catch the production errors within your staging environments, try to catch your staging errors within your development environments, and try to catch as much as the things within the code itself. So we've been building quite a few uh, extensions, and few of the ones which are popular are the Java, the Java extension, which has got more than 20 million downloads, uh, Ansible extension, uh, which has got around 500k downloads, and uh, qu quite a few of these uh, extensions help you. And there's also another extension which can help you uh, 
connect to your production environments and uh, if you're using OpenShift and directly uh, control it from this, uh, from this uh, en environment. So th these are a few of the ways in which you can, uh, you can use uh, dependency analytics and uh, uh, try to uh, re rebuild your programs or uh, uh, various uh, activities. Um, another tool uh, which we see is uh, uh, within, the, within the projects itself, uh, so what we do is this is how a typical uh, OpenShift uh, uh, developer topology looks like. Uh, you'll see more and more of these uh, images. Uh, like uh, within this, uh, if we take a look at our uh, build pipeline, so every time we make uh, we make a change, it is going to trigger certain uh, it is going to tr uh, trigger certain um, uh, uh, actions. So like for example, it's going to get your git clone package build push, and along with this, there are quite a bit of security checks which happen in uh, inside. So the way the developer uh, the developer uh, load cognitive load is reduced is they just they just can focus on the code. They are good at coding. They are just uh, you know making commits and changes, maybe to a branch, maybe to a, uh, m maybe to a certain tag or a master itself. As soon as the code checks come in place, all of these checks, like security scanning, uh, and also checking for any uh, you know typo squatting uh, errors or uh, build build errors which can happen, because the vulnerabilities can occur from any of the phases: the code phase, the build phase, and even in your deploy phase. So it. There are various gates and checks which are uh, which are in place for each and every component out there, and uh, uh, it, it depends on your enterprise software contracts, what, what and all you want to put in place. All of these things can be triggered just by uh, just by building your uh, checking in your code. So uh, that way, the developer uh, need not know what are uh, they need not pick up skills around CI, what extensions they need to be using, and all of those. All of those things happen automatically within the project. So in the in the developer hub uh, deep dive project and. Then then later we have a trusted supply chain dedicated talk. Uh, I'll show you how, how uh, this one can be, uh, can be achieved. One, by looking at reducing cognitive load with developer hub, uh, getting you into that, f when you're in that flow state, making sure that you have no distractions and you're able to really code productively. That's where you have the Podman desk desktop. And then for the feedback loop, you know, all your transitive dependencies, you know, making sure that's trusted content, the security vulnerabilities flagged off, giving you recommendations and so on comes from the trusted software supply chain. So the whole idea is that developer experience is not just about the tools, right? It's also about the community. It's about education. It is about events like this. It's about the blogs, articles, hands-on, tutorials, videos, presentations, and so much more that you will find if you go to the developer.redhat.com uh, website and where you will find a lot of uh, uh, interesting things to browse through. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event today. You, uh, you know, have several resources that you can access. You can take a screenshot of this if you like. That can actually help you uh, get you know, to that ideal state. And we also, you can learn a lot more uh, about what we talked about you know, through any of these links. Okay? Yeah. All of these will be available to you later as well. And through the various sessions today, they will get reinforced and you'll get a chance to see many of them in action. With that, Ramki and I would like to thank you for your attention and over to our host for the next session. Thank you.